Good, so let's begin. Thank you for coming. I actually watched uh, yesterday the lecture on the same topic I gave six years ago in Studio 9, and I will start in the same way, um, saying thank you, especially because of the weather conditions that uh, makes extra work to be inside of a studio now. Uh, luckily, today was not as hot as other days. Um, and I will also try to make it uh, somehow dynamic, uh, not just me talking. This is why I, I was wondering which other types of material I can bring to share with you. It's a long-term research that went through many different phases. And also for me, it's special to bring it here in the context of Hatsete, um, knowing also that uh, this topic or, uh, in general, uh, professionalism in the arts is something that uh, sometimes in the in the program is not directly touched or or developed as a as a class or as a seminar, and at least this uh, short little lecture can bring some questions that of course uh, uh, we can later on another day continue talking discussing. Um, I'm not streaming on Instagram, it's just to have the notes in front of me. Um, so the topic of the lecture is ambition, but it's also like an alibi or an excuse to, to enter into other, um, other things that I will also introduce from the very beginning, which is also what is the relation in such a big terms between art and life. Uh, is uh, art just your professional activity? You work as an artist and then um, your life is not necessarily connected or influenced by your practice, your work, your projects, or in which extent art and life are uh, completely entangled and intermingled uh, to the extent that you can actually realize that you have also an artistic practice, not just for what you do in the studio, for what you do with your different media, your discipline, your projects, but actually how accordingly your artistic pra practice infiltrates or permeates in the different aspects of your life. So I've been asking myself these kind of questions for a long time, also in the way that, uh, yeah, how can I find some kind of, um, the word could be integral practice that is not just uh, belonging to one specific uh, part of my life, but uh, rather a practice that is infiltrating in all the different aspects. So. For example, in the way that I am moving in the studio as a dancer, as a mover, as a choreographer, what are the implications of these qualities, of these principles, of these uh, uh, ideas uh, in the way that I relate in other uh, aspects in my life with people, um, with uh, colleagues from the profession, um, and so on and so on. So, this is already like to bring a little bit this very big frame and, um, and also to think together. Uh, all these topics are also, as you can imagine, very personal because each of us has uh, different situations and conditions. And uh, I'm going to try as much as possible to open it up and to make it also um, that everyone can jump into the different diagrams, into the different ideas. But of course, it's going to be impossible that I can actually resonate with every particular case of uh, all of you. And this is why at the end, I'm hoping that you will also uh, contradict me or add things that I, I forgot or I didn't mention, I didn't even consider at all. Um, so please also interrupt me anytime if you think that uh, there is something urgent to say. I promised myself that I will not rush the introduction so let's see how long I managed to, to delay the beginning. The, um, yeah, so the, the lecture has the same title as this very small book, which is just uh, one of the outcomes of all this journey. And I want to mention also that uh, I came to dance by accident. It was also something that I never expected to happen. My um, background, or let's say what, what I studied was philosophy. and. Since I moved to Berlin uh, by accidents or, let's say, circumstances of life, contingencies, I ended up uh, entering into the contemporary dance performance field. And also, I realized at the beginning that um, 
my first impression was actually to realize how lucky I was to have a background in philosophy because I would have never expected that in dance uh, people will walk with all these books of philosophers. Uh, <laughs> so I thought that, well, okay, I already did some home, homework. <laughs> and uh, so that was a, a pleasant feeling to see that uh, I am welcome also not only because of how I move or how I can be on the stage, but also there is a lot of exchange of ideas and let's say phil philosophy being practiced. And this is something that I wanted also to underline that in a way art can be understood as a practical philosophy. And uh, this is also something again connected to this idea of expanding the practice instead of separating disciplines and saying this is art and this is philosophy. My attempt is always to find how to make blurry the boundaries between disciplines and media. And in this case, since I was more or less belonging to both fields, I didn't want to feel that I am separating myself or being two, two th different things, but more to ask myself questions that can be related to both uh, at the same time. And for example, in, in philosophy, there is already a very long tradition that has been asking these kind of questions. Uh, in, there are different ways of referring to this. In German, they call it Lebenkunst. In Latin, they used to refer to it as Ars Vivendi, the art of living, uh, the care of the self. I mean, there are different traditions inside this tradition, but the, um, the idea was also from the very beginning when we consider our life as a whole, uh, and when we ask ourselves the question, how do I move? Uh, not just in the studio, not just with my body, but how does life moves, how my life is moving. So this is also an invitation to think of life as the subject or let's say as the entity or what we are uh, as artists considering how life can move, what are the different ways that life can move. And I'm already introducing that uh, there are all already like in, depending on which uh, place of society we belong or we, uh, interact with, there are already some pre-established or pre um, predefined, pre-designed trajectories uh, for us since we are kind of uh, born and, and the more we uh, move on, we realize that, uh, yeah, like uh, there are some kind of pre-established uh, trajectories for life. And the question here will be like, instead of submitting to the already, already existing choreographies, and that uh, we all try to fit in and to adjust to, to them. Like for example, in the art, case of art professionalism, the idea will be since we want to expand our artistic practice uh, into the realm of how do we move in life, the question for every artist will be how, hello, how do you, I mean, how do you access the structure is already in itself an artistic question. And how do you solve it could be solved also by your artistic practice and not necessarily uh, informing yourself what are the, where are the grants or where to apply or in which venue to present work or to whom we talk. Uh, also to consider that these different choices that we make, these different movements so that uh, we take, uh, they might also, they could also respond to a practice or, or to let's say to a kind of a artistic intention. And this is where I want to bring a little bit the, the topic today and the awareness that and always try to come back to the, for example, to the body sometimes, uh, but also to speak in general terms or abstract terms about life because something sometimes ungraspable and it will be also, hi, please, don't be afraid. I know, um, I lost it. It's good that I lost it. So, yes, yeah, so I interrupt myself and I wanted to start with this video because uh, on the topic of ambition, already 2017, that's five years ago, uh, we did a TV program uh, together with Agata Siniarska and more collaborators. And that was actually the very first uh, TV show we made. And we chose the topic of ambition because also in that time it was the moment that I was writing the book, so I wanted also to bring things together. And just for you to see how the, what are different formats that we also wanted to talk about this, not just like writing a book or having conversations, but also we started to 
to make interviews in different fields because in that time I was also giving a workshop on what are the um, clashes or differences between art and entrepreneurship, especially in the ecosystem of Berlin that in that time, since 2014, 15, Berlin became like the so-called new Silicon Valley and there were so many startups appearing here. So uh, creative industry hijacked creativity from, from the art, especially in Berlin in such a, uh, with such a fertile ground. And there was a little bit this sensation that indeed creativity has been hijacked and uh, all this, even the discourse itself of art has been appropriated by, by the creative industry, business, the startups and so on. So all of a sudden, on one hand, artists could find a, f a new field or a different place where they can interact with or make uh, even a career. But um, also on the other hand, uh, it, it was very controversial or problematic because at the same time, what are the differences? Let's be clear, no? On one hand, we have the whole uh, neoliberalist for profit economy playing a role, influencing the, the ecosystem of the city, turning the city into a different place to live, uh, while the ecosystem of the independent scene in Berlin was also keeping things in a different way, no? So not only in terms of economy, prices, finances, uh, gentrification, but also uh, the, the words that we use. And uh, so I spent like a month making a workshop and researching on, on these differences between art and artist and entrepreneur, and also interviewing people, trying to, to see how the logics and mechanisms of innovation uh, work, and also how art distinguishes itself from innovation. What are the differences? Uh, so that was in that time, the place uh, I was asking myself questions together with other people. And we made this uh, TV program also to bring this awareness and to ask artists what do they think about this um, creative industry hijacking creativity and how do, how do they think that art operates in a different way? What are the differences between being an artist and an entrepreneur? So I just wanted to play the introduction because also is doing the job for me to introduce some topics that uh, I can drink water in the meantime. Let's see if the sound works. You chose one that's... Yeah, so this is in Ausland. It's a venue in Prenzlauer Berg. And as you see, we have the audience behind and the guests will now, after the introduction, will appear. Seems today be extremely popular and complex at the same time. It is ambition. Together with invited guests, we will discuss ambition, trying to bring some clarity to this concept, problematizing, shaking, and tearing it apart. Let's have our first glimpse of the sun. What is ambition? What is its specific meaning? If we start asking Google for a definition of ambition, we get the following answer. A strong desire to do or achieve something a desire and determination to achieve success. We found this to be a very vague understanding of ambition, too general and broad. Also, we found it problematic to understand ambition as a synonym of any form of striving for. For instance, the fact that somebody does something passionately and with a strong determination, it does not mean necessarily that this person is ambitious. Oh, we were not really satisfied because we think that not every driving force is ambitious. So, what is it then that distinguishes ambition from other driving forces? What is so specific of ambition? We continued searching and we found that business and innovation are partially responsible for how ambition is understood today. Here, we encountered a benevolent understanding of ambition, which is decorated with the rhetoric of innovation and business that cover it up with optimism and positivity. Ambition, then, refers to career plan, success, and upward mobility. Ambition wants to change the world. Ambition keeps you on the run for a successful and outstanding career. Ambition tells you, do your best, do your best. So, in order to find a different version of ambition, we have to look at the etymology of the word. And for the first time, we found a pejorative understanding of it. 
Ambition is now an eager, excessive desire to achieve preferment, honor, superiority, privilege, recognition, fame, or power. The term ambition first appeared in the middle of 14th century. The root ambi means exactly both, on both sides, and it comes from Latin ambitionem, which means a going around specifically for candidates for office in Rome, soliciting votes. Hence, ambition is a striving for favor, courtesy, flattery, a desire for honor, thirst for popularity. In its early use, it was always pejorative. Ambition was always grouped with pride and vainglory, an inordinate or, or overreaching desire. After looking at these three different conceptions of this term, we realize the complexity that it takes to bring some light into what ambition means. We still continue asking ourselves, what is a specific of ambition? What distinguishes it from any other driving force? And we didn't give up. And that is why we went out to ask different people about the precise definition of ambition. Tonight, we are going to share with you different views on this notion struggling with the nature of this problem, diving into the depths of its complexity. You have the whole TV program online. You can watch it if you want. We had the guest, um, uh, uh, Kasia Bolinska, Juan, Juan Dominguez, um, Eva Meyer Keller, uh, Florian Feigel, uh, Britta Wirt Müller, and I think Th they were our guests that uh, that evening, and you can also see the interviews that we did with people from Beta House, uh, a place where it's a co-working space. In that time, it was very popular. Good. So, um, if you realize, the first uh, surprise was to see that for many centuries, ambition was a pejorative term. Uh, and for example, when you ask somebody from the 17th century, such as Spinoza, and you read in his book, Ethics, that uh, ambition was considered even a madness mm -hmm. when uh, analyzing people's behavior and what are somehow the, uh, yeah, th what moves people. Uh, it was considered something that uh, is really like a, a worth of, uh, of treatment or let's say something to, to keep an eye on it. And the fascinating question is like, how is it possible that it became the most legitimized and driving force of a society. Does this mean that society is also mad? <laughs> that could be like a one question, like a, where have we arrived to the, for the fact that uh, something that before was considered madness now is actually the most legitimized driving force for people to uh, find achievement in life. And um, so this is why there was this um, idea to bring the emphasis that uh, ambition has been now let's say reformulated by the uh, neoliberalism and the whole culture of innovation for the sake of, uh, yeah, like uh, bringing this kind of uh, a state of mind and body for always uh, having something to achieve, an external goal. And if you look at actually the, the definition of ambition based on this um, etymology that uh, it was in Roman Empire, the, the politicians going around because ambition actually literally means to go around uh, searching for, for the steam of people, in, in this case to be voted, to receive the vote of, of the citizens in order to achieve a, a position of privilege or power and therefore also to get advantage, I, I guess, also from many other aspects. So the, um, the idea of ambition in this case, if we lo even look at it from a choreographic perspective, it implies to move around in the ambience which is a word that also shares the same root as um, ambition. So uh, the um, ambitious uh, body moves around, but not just simply moves around, it's also asking for, for steam, it's asking for um, recognition or to be chosen one. And um, in order to move upwards into an already existing structure of power, um, then you name it, in, depending on which structure you are operating, you can name what is waiting also on the top of the pyramid. Uh, so it's upwards mobility, also from another perspective. It's not just 
moving around, it's moving around for the sake of escalating and uh, upwards mobility. So the vertical line in this case is somehow giving the, the choreographic principle of where movement should be intended uh, and the purpose of it. So I came up with this, um, just to wrap it up, this definition of ambition that is an external goal oriented. Um, there are other driving forces that are finding the, the purpose of their actions in an intrinsic value. In this case, the ambition belongs to the, those driving forces that are moved by external goals. It's a driving force whose purpose is to elaborate on a plan. So here also you, you see how in business uh, they make some, so much emphasis, for example, the disposition of the coach which is also uh, granted by this whole context of global economy of, and for profit economy or self-management, self-optimization, self-improvement. Um, uh, the coach will also try to come up with a plan for you. Like a, you can call it business plan or a career plan because your life has been already, you can actually foresee what are the next steps. And this is why ambition can only function with a pre-established trajectory or with a pre-established choreography. If you remove this uh, uh, already existing pyramid, ambition will not find its way. It would be a little bit like lost. And that's also important that it needs a plan because also plan is the way of also design thinking, which is an, another expression very popular in innovation. Uh, so to elaborate on a plan to gain esteem of others. So you see here that in a way you are, I mean, the. Ambition is a slave of what is the, the opinion that others have of us or of you. So you depend so much that, they, that you get the, the favor or the preferment from other people that in a way you submit uh, what happens to you to the election or selection of a jury or people who are already uh, key holders or somebody who has the, the possibility to choose for you or to vote for you, um, to, to select you, to choose in this case of art, it's also very clear who is doing this. And uh, in order to, to move up the career ladder and to finally achieve a privileged social position of superiority, such as power, recognition, honor, and fame. This is also very interesting, the word fame. Um, also, the, the word fame literally means uh, something is being outspoken. Uh, so it means that somebody is talking a lot about you. Fame shares the same root as fari, which is also like the to speak, to say. So the more your name is being mentioned, you know, like name dropping, uh, the more your name is associated with your profession because also to profess uh, means to, to claim that you want to be identified in a social context with one activity. In our case, we can say we want to profess to be artists because we also want to be hired as artists. So the professionals, they have the, the first need that the professional has is to be identified with a particular activity, a job. Mm -hmm. So other people, when they think of, okay, I need uh, to repair my door, and they think of a carpenter, the first name that is associate, associated with a uh, carpenter will pop up. So th this whole idea of uh, a professional or an ambitious professional is going around offering your services. I'm a carpenter, I'm a carpenter. And when the day you need a carpenter, my name will come to your mind because I kept telling you every day that I'm a carpenter. <laughs> so the, the idea of, of professionalism is rooted uh, completely with this idea of self-promotion, self-branding uh, from already like a very long time ago. It's not just uh, something about uh, artists do or freelance artists they have to do to, to sell your work, to um, maximize opportunities in the different contexts, in the different networks. Uh, it's something that we need to, or sometimes, I mean, I don't want to generalize, but sometimes it feels that there's this game that uh, we didn't decide. And uh, there are certain occasions or certain situations that the artist is supposed to speak about her work or, or, or the, any other project, no? uh, to present yourself, etc. Et so there's this whole, I mean, I, I, wanted, I didn't want to bring too many ideas around it, but you can see already in this graphic. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, how professionalism is connected also with publicity in the sense of going public. Uh, this idea of being visible, no? showing up to the different occasions versus hiding at home and thinking that you should be somewhere else uh, being present. No? This is also something that the tyranny of visibility in our field. The fact that uh, sometimes it feels that we are supposed to show up in, in different venues, in different places. How fame is connected to, to professionalism also in a kind of uh, uh, implicit way. And therefore success and the different uh, hierarchies because it would be no place for everyone on top of the pyramid. So that's also uh, an evidence that competitiveness is what rules the intersubjective relations of people. Based on this game, unfortunately, we are competing uh, for the few resources or for the few opportunities or for the few places in the program. And um, of course, it depends on external validation. So no matter how much you claim that your art is good, uh, this will not grant you access to, to the structure. So it's also depending on the expert, the curator, the programmer, other artists, colleagues, etc. different legitimized structures that the, they will say your work is worth to be presented. Um, and so on. So my next step, what I wanted to bring now is a, a different word to find a little bit of uh, air also to, to breathe and from where we could actually think an alternative to this subjectivity of the artist that is, has to, to fit into the professional sphere and being driven by ambition. Um, this is actually the, the word, I found two words, one at the beginning it sounded good, but then I realized that uh, it, it doesn't sound as good as the other one. So the word I chose today is dilettantism, because the problem with amateur is that the amateur still, um, they, they take professionalism as the reference in order to, to, yeah, to measure what they do. While the dilettant is completely independent from, hi Nick, I didn't see you, is completely independent from, from the external validation. The, um, also the, the first dilettants, they also had the privilege of uh, being already in a very good social position of, for example, no nobles or bourgeois people that they don't need to sell their work to, to do art. And so the dilettant will be the person that can afford to make art without the need of selling it. And just simply for the pleasure, the word dilettant comes from delight or delightfulness. So the idea of uh, finding, yeah, an activity is delightful uh, is the main reason or is the reason why you do art. This is also like an important question, I guess, for every artist to ask oneself, what are the reasons that you give to yourself to make art? Is it because um, indeed you are searching for all these professional uh, achievements? Is it because um, you delight yourself doing it? Uh, regardless of people calling you naive? Uh, is it because, I don't know, you are devoted to make this? Your existential uh, ground depends on art making? Uh, can be because you have some political agenda and art is your vehicle? Uh, so this is why the question of, about driving forces here is, um, is a key question because based on what you are moved to do art, depending what is the driving force that uh, drives your art making, you are also legitimizing uh, a way of living. And this is where I want to connect things that uh, there is always this extra step to, to think, which is also what are we legitimizing with the, with the practices that we do? What are we legitimizing with the way that we understand being an artist? Uh, and uh, yeah, so in order not to only legitimize the professional game or not to order legitimize the being an ambitious artist, uh, it feels important also to come up with alternative uh, in the sense of what are the different driving forces that can drive artists to make art and what are also the different driving forces, um, no, and the different how life as a trajectory might look like that is not simply obeying to the idea of a career, to the idea of a professional trajectory ruled by success or in this case also recognition or fame. 
uh, but also how do we find all these different reasons for art making that regardless of, uh, of having or not success in the professional field, we will still make art. And this is also an, an important point because there is not only one reason to evaluate if you should continue to make art or if your art uh, has value or not. So that could be like a, something to keep in mind and this is why the, the second part of my talk, I want to bring things towards this, uh, this direction. So the, the dilettante started having a, a privileged position of uh, having enough resources not to be worried selling the art. And then dilet the dilettante also evolved in many different ways. Uh, this is why also this graphic, no? That uh, it relates a little bit to the different ways that dilettantism sometimes is associated also with the anti-specialist. A dilettante also is a person that might be uh, achieving a proficiency, proficiency level in different uh, art makings. You can be today a photographer, tomorrow a painter, after tomorrow a choreographer, next week a uh, filmmaker. So there are many e examples also in art history of, uh, of dilettantes or even uh, artists that has been considered great artists with, for example, literature, but they also made photography and films. And uh, there are also funny anecdotes of uh, how they were completely unskilled using the photo camera. Uh, but yeah, uh, so also this is a, a question of uh, how skills uh, are legitimized as, a, as an important element in your practice. In professionalism, they are. Uh, we are supposed to be very skillful in the things that we do. So in dilettantism, this is also something secondary. Like uh, you, you need to be like a well-trained dancer, for example, to make dances. Something that we know, especially, I guess, uh, in Berlin or in some context here in the city. So the... Um, I thought of, uh, in this moment in, uh, of the talk, inviting you to, to a shot, if you want. <laughs> yeah. So just please, uh, you can pass around the, the shots. Yeah, yeah, you can help yourself with your colleague. And oh, yes, uh, I chose bourbon. There are still cherries. Yes, because I needed some time to think how to continue. Okay. <laughs> So I found the page. So I want to read a, a portrait of a non-ambitious artist, also inspired by dilettant practices. And I, I will read this portrait. So the non-ambitious artist. The artist with no plan. And also you can see how things resonate, no? Uh, some of them are a bit more ironic than others. Don't take it too serious. Thank you. Yes. Um, the artist with no plan. The artist who does not go around striving for preference. The artist who is independent from the good opinion of other people. The artist who has no opportunistic mind. The artist who has no special interest in promoting herself publicly. The artist who, doesn't, who does not suffer from a status anxiety. The artist who has no aspirations to fulfill any professional standards. The artist who does not submit to the path of the career ladder. 
the artist who has no intentions of becoming famous or influential, the artist who is not interested in appearing in the catalogue or in the book of art history, the artist who is not thirsty for reputation, the artist who does not submit to external validation, the artist who is never afraid of missing out on opportunities, the artist who refuses to compete with their colleagues, the artist with no desire for honour, the artist who gives more importance to the intrinsic value of making art than to the outcome, the artist who thinks that the artwork is more important than the maker. So these are just like some paint brushes on this portrait. And of course, like it's also taking some kind of, uh, uh, taking a little bit the boundaries of the figure as well to, to provoke some thoughts or not. And um, so in this moment, I thought of uh, proposing a, an exercise um, which will consist that uh, if I will give you a, a piece of paper, um, can also spread away. It will take only one minute. Who needs pens or pencils? You can pass them around. Don't distract me, please. Yeah, so you can divide the page in, in, two, in two sides. And also this is working like a sketch for you. And um, I mean, the, the first part is a bit like a, just to reflect on what, what we said before about the career ladder. So if this, uh, wait. Can I use your page as an example? Yeah. yeah, so this is something that we did a lot in the workshop, for example, all these different exercises of how to visualize trajectories, life trajectories. So once you come up with, uh, it's like a, maybe with the scores of movement as well, uh, how you can train these different ways how life can move based on different patterns and analyzing these patterns and what are the consequences of these patterns. So for example, if we will take now the first part of the page and the left side, chronologically to the right side, is uh, from the moment that you started being active as a professional artist, or making art, let's say. Let's call it making art easier. To the right side, that will be the present time. So if we will need to draw a curve from, and from bottom to up, it's a level of, uh, based on your own terms, what was the level of success, recognition, let's say validation of your work. From the moment that you started to make work, you can name it when was this, which year, etc. How do you think that your art making, how do, would you visualize the curve of your success, recognition, fame, uh, validation until today? How will this curve look, will look like? On this first page, then we will use the second page for something else. Right. And it would be always in relation to others, to what the perception from an outside. Yeah, from a professional. Yeah. yeah. How many people came and how many people kind of. Yeah, how much your work was visible or programmed, for example. I mean, I don't want to name it. Yeah. You, you know better what was. Yeah. But not from your, in, from your own perspective, how much you felt. No, more from like an external mm -hmm. validation.
Okay, slowly coming to an end. Yes, ideally we will always laugh about this. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, I mean, of course you can take this task uh, with you and be very precise if you want on your own, which I think is also interesting to, to look at it. But also one of the reasons also is to understand that uh, Sometimes the impression is that our professional life should be the priority in, in our lives and therefore that uh, when, we ask the, when we answer the question, how are we doing, immediately we answer depending on, for example, this, this graphic. So the, um, the attempt is always to <coughs> not to submit to this way of evaluating yourself uh, based on this curve and based on this external criteria of validation, but rather to come up with alternatives of uh, how do you visualize, how do you move in life. Mm. So this is why now on the second part, what I, I, I do and I will propose you is that, for example, when you think of how life behaves in general, um, from the moment you were born till today, what were based, for example, on what were the major events in your life, major uh, decisions that you made, things that happened to you. Since we are taking so such a short time, don't choose too many, but just how would you visualize how, how has been the trajectory of your life, not based on professional uh, criteria, but more in general terms, like uh, maybe based on the different cities where you moved and you were based, or different studies that you took, different jobs, relationships, friendships, uh, I don't know, uh, tra traveling to Mars and back, I don't know. <laughs> Depending what happened to you, uh, how, in this case also not chronologically, doesn't need to look like a curve, how would you visualize uh, the way that uh, your life, since you were born until today, you think that if you could zoom out and have an overview, how does it look like? It looks like a network, a labyrinth? Does it look like a circle that you always find yourself oscillating between the same things? Does it look like a very clear line that you were moving from here to there? Does it look like, a, I don't know, like a squares and circles? So it's more also to, for you to, to face the task rather than to now resolve it perfectly.
good, so sorry to interrupt you so quickly. What probably most of the cases we can see is that now the visualization doesn't look so simple and uh, we see the complexity of life uh, from a different angle and that uh, somehow it will be like an act, act of violence to try to to translate this second graphic into the first one no? or, or let's say like to <coughs> to try to simplify life based on on the first criteria as you can imagine this exercise could take us into many different directions we could start to pair up and actually to discuss together what does it mean your graphic um, just wanted to a little bit like uh, stimulate some uh, sketches in, in your mind and now also to slowly arrive into to an end the, I want to introduce another term also to mention that the um, as I said before this tradition of the eleven schools or Ars Vivendi the art of living is something that uh, um, the, the main the main thing is to understand ourselves and life not as, as submitted to a fixed pattern uh, of identity but neither of how we should move in life in, in both cases so if we take seriously this fluidity contingency of life unpredictability of how events happen to us accidents incidents uh, how the event encounter us um, instead of coming up with a strategy and a design thinking and a plan uh, it feels that uh, life is asking more for a tactical thinking rather than a strategic or it's asking more for different ways of responding on real time to the events rather than trying to impose in life um, a, a plan and to try to materialize this plan as, as much as you can no? it would be like a way of forcing life to go into the motorway or into the trajectory that you want when sometimes also life is uh, insinuating other directions uh, asking us to take a detour or all of a sudden to to make a completely turn around so that's also the idea of betraying ambition it was also this way of uh, since ambition has been in, to such uh, an extent legitimized that um, is, uh, is present uh, also what that what does it mean in each, each individual case each singular case what is the relation that we could think of this betrayal no this kind of uh, trying to betray this plan uh, the expectations that we might have about the future the things that we are supposed to achieve because we, we don't know why maybe some kind of uh, something I don't know there are many people for example in the workshops that they were saying that yeah but uh, my family has expectations of me of uh, me being this or me being that uh, I don't know if in, it's the same in the case of the art uh, that maybe it's not the same but in any case like um, this idea of the subjectivity or the self that um, is avoiding to solidify into some kind of stipulated uh, validated forms of being ways of living and the same way that when we go to the studio and we start to research on a movement quality or in some kind of concept or any you name it what whatever you research on the studio or in the, in the street or in the forest uh, in the same way how can you extend expand this research in the way that you move in life and how yeah what are the reasons you move in life in the way that you move are you responding to some somehow a practice that you are developing uh, day by day changing day by day adapting day by day uh, without this violence of trying to to fit things into some kind of uh, predefined uh, pathway and uh, and also realizing that maybe there is never a final stage there is never this kind of final goal or final achievement uh, we will maybe continue asking these questions until the last day I mean this doesn't mean that one day you come up with a formula I don't I don't believe or I don't think that there's a formula about the what how life should be lived in the best way uh, this is why the spirit of research implies always uh, not knowing versus pretending to know what is 
uh, going to happen and, and why things are going to be this way and not this other way. So I think that also to embrace uncertainty and this uh, contingent uh, condition of life to the, to the maximum. And, and still, instead of thinking that, okay, uh, life is going to move me uh, and I don't have any will, mm -hmm. I think that still the artistic practice can, yeah, can respond uh, or can be in dialogue at least without the need of uh, thinking that it's about controlling and manipulating life, but more like a, how do we create practices of being in dialogue with the events that happen to us un unexpectedly? Uh, how do we create an artistic practice that is also uh, responding to things in, in as they happen? Because uh, if we take uncertainty seriously, we don't know what is going to happen in any time. And uh, this is why slowly trying to understand then how to relate then to professionalism because uh, the dilettante model will say, okay, we don't need professional field. I, uh, I was asking also myself, what could be such a model that uh, still takes professionalism into consideration, but not as a goal in itself, but more as an arena where we actually operate and um, interact with. And this is the, the graphic that I wanted to bring for the last uh, part of this talk uh, is called the practice of anarchism, and as you can see, it's a circle. So instead of uh, having a line that is supposed always to move up upwards, escalating the different steps, uh, this is a circle. It's a never-ending practice, and the term anarchism literally means uh, not artist at all, and was a uh, was brought up during an interview to Marcel Duchamp because uh, it's a very good example of an artist uh, retiring from being an artist, but actually this retirement uh, was also is believed to be taken as an, also like a, a tactic of uh, making art in a different way out of the spotlight. So anarchism was a way of saying that uh, no need to call yourself an artist, but maybe it's actually better to escape from the category and the label of artist if artist is something solidified and fixed. So I prefer not to be an artist if artist is something that is actually labeling me and restricting my movements. Mm -hmm. So the idea of anarchism is not anti-art or anti-artist, but actually this paradoxical condition of always about to stop being an artist or always about to become an artist. So it's this moment that <laughs> you are never an artist, you know? It's like either you are about to stop being an artist or you are about to become one. And I think it's also very interesting if we also want to integrate paradoxes into our practice. So basically, if uh, dilettantism could be considered as the opposite of professionalism, uh, the idea of anarchism would imply how to bring them together, how to create bridges, uh, which means that what would be then the reason for a dilettante to enter professional, professional life? Mm. Of course, you can always claim I need money, great. Um, but then instead of submitting to this achievement ideology, there is this idea of uh, mischieving instead of achieving. Uh, mischieving, which is always understood as a deviation. So instead of a straight line that reaches the goal, as the plan was meant to happen. The mischief man is, ah, I was about to hit this goal and pss, I deviate in the last second. And I, at, and at the end, I arrive somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So how does this happen? There are many different ways. There are uh, all these different tactics of uh, infiltration. So actually, to enter the professional structure is not for the sake of um, Ambition, meaning that it's not for the sake of achieving recognition, uh, success, etc., but more, you take it more as a kind of a political agenda in the sense that you want to uh, affect the structure with your presence. So knowing that you actually have enough power on your own in terms of autonomy, intrinsic value, you have maybe strong ethical convictions about how to validate yourself, you don't even... I mean, if you will have money, 
maybe you would you wouldn't even resign completely from doing professional art mm -hmm. because uh, you don't need an external validation system to to say that what you are doing is art but nevertheless you want to access professionalism for different reasons so this i wanted to to read for the last time today some of these different practices of, of infiltration which could be for example to inject anomaly and eccentricity into the into the structure of professionalism meaning that also the the advantage of uh, mm, becoming influential in the sense of receiving visibility will be to take this moment of visibility as an opportunity to propose different values different from the ones that are dominant and valid, validated by an ideology so a dominant ideology so that would be a, also like a practice of infiltration for the sake of injecting these an anomalous practices, uh, eccentric values that uh, in a way they either crack the system or, or at least propose alternatives or create a friction. So for example, in this case, education or uh, in the educational context could be also like a good example of uh, how to transmit different kinds of values rather than the dominant ones injecting your own specificity and your eccentricity. Yeah. Another practice of infiltration could be the, once you are on the spotlight, maybe you got this uh, uh, invitation to perform in a venue, in a festival, in a place. So you can also try to come up with an, with an artwork that is un undigestible, unassimilable by the, by the context where you are working. Something that in a way cannot be digested. So if you produce maybe a monster or something that is um, radically different from um, the context where, where you are uh, presenting your work, something that produces something that is impossible to be transferred into symbolic value, for example, or impossible to be transferred as a currency in terms of uh, yeah, artistic currency. The um, impossible to consume, how do you present a black hole, a blind spot, uh, something that is impossible to be incorporated or understood, impossible to be connected, or not something that is uh, creating too much complexity, too much paradoxes, or it maybe it's too awkward to be digested, even too traumatic to, to, be, yeah, to be assimilated. So that could be another practice of infiltration. Um, another one is uh, sabotage. Uh, the dilettante could also understand this uh, infiltration as a, as a way of generating interferences, uh, damaging the, the, the structure in order to prevent it from being successful. Um, you could also apply a process of de-privileging uh, yourself and the, the, what is around you, not achieving goals, uh, sabotaging your, your plans, um, interrupting the machinery, provoking a break in the continuity, mm -hmm. uh, a ruin and a spoiling, uh, making it not operable. So something that an art, uh, an art that is not efficient and somehow in incompetent. Uh, yeah, there are more examples here in the book, but I'm kind of losing saliva in my mouth. Um, and I also have the feeling that it's already uh, an hour. So yeah, I think that I want to stop now. And then, as you can see, I mean, this whole idea could be, could take place more like a, spending some days together, not just one hour or two hours, but coming up with exercises together of this kind of how can we also uh, inspire, inspire each other in how we, are we already having these different practices of uh, infiltration or these different um, tactics of uh, every time that you find yourself into the, into the structure. Uh, so we will share also all these tools and, and, and practices and, and come up with alternative models for self-validation as well, that we are not only depending on external uh, structure to say if we are worth as an artist and, or our work is worth. And uh, of course, this can go in many different directions. The second 
chapter of the book that I didn't mention at all is how, for example, to do this collectively, uh, not on, as an individual subjectivity, but more together. Um, and um, yeah, and ideally we will also develop some kind of prototype or a kind of um, a sketch of this uh, choreographic practice of moving in life. Uh, and then there's also this whole uh, realm of uh, in which extent this practice of moving in life actually uh, moves accordingly to the way that you move also as a dancer or as a mover or as a performer. Uh, the, um, one of my last uh, publications uh, is actually taking Tai Chi and Qigong as a model to come up with what will be a, how, how to move in life accordingly to the princip somatic principles of Qigong, for example. So uh, in Qigong, there is no upwards without downwards. So already the paradoxes are included in every single movement. You cannot move forwards without going downwards. So upwards mobility will be nonsense based on the model of, of Qigong, which is also influenced by Taoism, for example. So it will be very interesting to, yeah, to, to come up with all these different models. And of course, uh, we can also take this day as a beginning of something, uh, if you want. Um, good, so now if you want to say things or maybe talk about the graphics you made, we can also stop here and say goodbye, maybe open the curtains and let some air enter.